Hi, this is Linda and Aaron with Traveling Flamingo, and today we're going to talk about a bunch of new rules that were issued by the EU, or at least recommendations by the EU, to help cruising restart again in Europe. And this is probably what we can expect to see in North America. All of that coming right up. So a few days ago, the European Union issued a whole bunch of recommendations on how to restart cruising uh, within Europe. And this was supported by the CLIA, which is the Cruise Line Industry Association, which is made up with made up of just about every major cruise line you could think of. So this is in support with them. And you know, we've gone a long time now without any any sort of notification or anything about potential cruising starting up again in North America. And you know, we've all been kind of wondering what's going on. And it seems as though the EU has decided to go ahead and sort of you know move forward and get cruising moving forward again. So we're gonna go through exactly what that outlines. We're going to break this into two videos because it is 49 pages long. There's a lot of stuff in it. Uh, we are going to break it up though in a way that talks about what the changes are for the passenger and then what the changes are for the cruise operations. Mm -hmm. And that cruise operations is obviously impacting the customer as well because it adds in a bunch of really cool stuff around what the cruise line has to do if there is a case of COVID that happens on a cruise ship. So there's plans and stuff in place, and we'll go through that in the next episode. So as Aaron said, when we broke up the document, today we're gonna to be going over the changes that are going to be most impactful to the passengers, I would say, on a day-to-day -day cruising when it happens to start up again. So the first section of that we're looking at is pre-boarding. And so this is before you get on the ship, what are some of the things that you can experience? So we'll try and walk you through that, what it would look like if you were to arrive. So the cruise lines have to have an effective exclusion policy. So this is a way to identify passengers who have symptoms, who have come in contact with, with someone who's had COVID-19 in the last 14 days, or have tested positive for COVID via the RT-PCR testing. So it's, you know, trying to have stuff in place before you get on the cruise ship and, and they can't exclude people. The, uh, also a recommendation is for people in the high risk groups. So if you're over 65, if you have respiratory conditions, there isn't a specific mandate, but they do recommend that you go to your doctor and consult to make sure it is safe for you to travel, but you don't need to bring any documentation with you. So basically imagine you just got off your taxi, you're showing up at the cruise ship. What they outline is basically there would be two steps for uh, screening. You'd have a typical first screening process. This isn't performed by any medically trained personnel. This is just regular cruise personnel. They would be doing a temperature check to make sure that your temperature is okay. And there would be a questionnaire or survey that would preferably be digital. Uh, they would have people watching uh, the crowd for illness just to see if anyone's sort of exhibiting signs and so forth. And then from there, you're basically, uh, you have two options. You'll either continue on to board the ship because everything's okay, or you'll go into secondary screening. And in secondary screening, they will uh, ask you a whole bunch of additional questions just to make sure that you've not been in contact with people again, et cetera. I, may, I guess make sure your story's straight <laughs> in the case that maybe you're trying to get on anyways. Uh, they'll have a more in-depth questionnaire. This is performed by medically trained personnel. So this will be part of the medical office or I guess EMTs or something along those lines. They will do additional temperature screenings and they may also uh, give you an RT-PCR test and that's just the, the swab just to see if you have it. Uh, and that was uh, basically what you can experience when you move uh, from the taxi to getting onto the ship. That said, they did have two very important uh, things that they do mention in the document. One is they are very aware that asymptomatic carriers, everybody always says this, will not be identified through this process. But since that's a much smaller percentage, this will get a large group of people, uh, possibly. And also that they don't feel as though you can rely on virus testing. And one of the reasons for that is virus testing, one, it's very dependent apparently on uh, sort of the conditions, the temperature, things like that, uh, in terms of where they're doing it. But it's also very contingent on uh, people who come, who are incubating the virus, won't be caught by these systems. Mm -hmm. So if you are in the early stages of it, it's not gonna show either. So you could go through all of this screening and even have the, the test, the swab, and it still wouldn't show it, even though maybe a few days, you know, seven days in, you might start showing symptoms. 
And I think that's a really important point is that they understand that a temperature screening isn't going to get everybody. And when you when we read through the document and we'll include the link so if you're interested in reading through it as well, there are a lot of other things that the EU is recommending are put in place to prevent the spread if somebody is on board and is asymptomatic. And that's exactly what you'll see in the uh, next video we're going to post, which is just going to be about what are those conditions, what are those plans that need to be in place, how is the cruise line supposed to handle uh, mm -hmm. that happening, just because they know it's probably going to happen. You're probably going to have somebody with COVID on a ship. So what do you do then? So that'll be the next video. So now we've completed the screening, we're getting on the ship and continuing on, there's a lot of other safety protocol that have been put in place. The one thing you're gonna be hearing over and over again is socially distancing 1.5 meters away from each other. So as much as possible, we'll be repeating that specifically for each category, but they're, they're maintaining the social distancing as much as possible. Another thing is wash your hands. <laughs> Just do it, wash your hands. So a whole lot of extra hand sanitizer, a lot of extra reminders to be washing your hands. And I think that's something that we're hearing in general in society right now, so it'll be pretty common. But there, I think where you will notice areas where there weren't hand sanitizers before, but there are now. They are also, of course, recommending face masks. So the recommendation here is that face masks should be used indoors or when you're not able to socially distance. So for instance, when you're, uh, you know, you know, the hallways can be very, very narrow when you're trying to get through there and you got people going all directions to your cabin. So that would be an area where they would expect you to be wearing a face mask. They would also recommend you wear a face mask during the embarkation process in the terminal. Uh, buses during transport, so if you're going off to one of your excursions, that's another recommendation. Uh, the narrow corridors, elevators on board. It'll be interesting elevators, I think, because they get so overwhelmed anyways, and if they start saying like only one couple at a time in an elevator, good luck with that. So, you know, get your stair climbing capabilities mm. in place, because I think there's going to be a lot of that. Uh, visiting the medical facility, of course, on board, and, you know, Worst case scenario, they say on uh, onboard lifeboats. Yeah. So hopefully you're never gonna have to be on the lifeboat. And even then your mask may not be what you're concerned about, but they do recommend that you have the face mask on if you're in lifeboats. Yeah, any, anytime you cannot be more than 1.5 meters away from somebody, have your mask on. So I think it's something that is gonna be expected that you're just carrying around with you, having one or two because you're gonna be needing them. Something which I thought was interesting too, they have respiratory etiquette. So that's pretty much how to sneeze and cough, that you should be sneezing into tissue, if you don't have a tissue, into your, into your elbow, washing your hands afterwards. They actually have recommended pamphlets in the room. You know, just happy vacation, you got your room, this is how you should sneeze. So, but again, it's just reminders that yes, you're on vacation, but it's important for everybody's health that you are being, being cautious. Yeah. And uh, another area that they talk about a lot is adequate ventilation. So making sure that there is as much fresh air as possible, uh, either within the ship or, you know, in other areas where ventilation is going to be important because again, you know, there's a lot of research going on about how long it can linger in the air. So getting that air circulating and re re refreshed is, is another important thing here. So the next area they talk a lot about is cleaning. So you're, you're on the ship, you understand what you need to do, you understand how you need to social distance and cough and all that other stuff. Uh, now, what about sort of the facilities and so forth? So there will be increased cleaning, especially in high, con high contact areas like restaurants, stale ra stair railings, things like that, where a lot of people are always sort of touching. If you do want to know more about what NCL is thinking about doing, we do have a video to that as well. And very similar in a lot of ways to what you hear here. Um, Cabins should be thoroughly cleaned and ventilated for one hour after cleaning before the next guest can arrive. So that's a bit interesting. So they're gonna, I guess, keep the keep the the rooms ventilated, either opening up a door or what have you. And if uh, an item cannot be disinfected, they're talking about it being removed. So for example, a coffee, uh, the coffee makers that you get, or the mini bar, et cetera, et cetera, things that aren't easy to sort of disinfect, the recommendation is to remove them from the rooms. And lastly, in elevators, it's encouraged, uh, you're encouraged not to use them uh, or allow limited sort of use. And if you do need to use them to wear a face mask. Mm -hmm. But again, that's gonna be very interesting on some of these large ships. I'm interested to see, as you were mentioning with the room cleaning, because 
the sheets, it's easy to take them off and wash them, all the blankets. But what do you do for the couches? Like, is that an issue? Is it not an issue? Um, as you said, NCL, we talk about the fogging machines. Like, are they going to bring in stuff like that? So just interested to see for some of those things that you can't remove, how do you sanitize them? So on to a topic which is most important for me is food. And I know that we've already had a lot of discussions about this and what it could look like. So it was nice to just see and get a little bit more specifics, what will be there, not be there, and how they're gonna do it to make sure that everybody is safe. So they do recommend any self-serve food operations should not happen. So that would be the buffets. Um, and, and you should be having the crew serving if you have to have a buffet. So if, if depending on the layout of the ship, we, you know what, we have to have a buffet, the crew should be serving, there should be extra shields up, the crew should be wearing personal protective equipment, even things like plates, utensils, those there should be crew members handing to you if you want water or juice you know we're used to just going and getting it ourselves nope there should be crew there to do it so again i think it's the less contact between passenger passenger touching things and you have your one crew member who should be sanitized and, and handing stuff out so that that will be interesting i think that could also slow things down so you're gonna have to look at that social distancing within as well you're seeing something similar at disney where if you have the refillable mugs you have to actually hand that refillable mug to a cast member for them to replace it with something mm. else so that you're able to to use it and you can't go up and do it yourself and in that case, like thinking of some of the lines we've seen at Disney to refill and the busyness around the pop machine, it'd probably be easier to have a socially distanced queue where one person is handing over at a time. Other things like salt and pepper, and I would imagine all condiments then should be in single service, uh, single, single, so, single serving. <laughs> it should be single serving. Um, unless you are able to sanitize between groups and parties so i don't know if maybe in dining rooms where you know you have seating and then you switch to another seating if they'll try and sanitize but i wouldn't be surprised if they just get rid of it and have all that single serving as much as possible and um, i also know that they've added in they recommend that you only dine with people who are in your cabin with you and uh <laughs> see this this is one of the things that i like i'm a little bit more on the introverted side when it comes to cruising and i i enjoy just sort of being on my own and not necessarily having to sit with a bunch of people even though that can of course be fun uh it's sort of a bit of a fear of mine when it comes to having to sit with random people i don't know for a meal so Aaron's the introverted one in the relationship, so he's not against not being able to sit with other people when we when we are away, but it, it does make sense in terms of, I guess, they'll maybe have more sets of smaller tables where maybe when you do have families stop traveling in bigger groups together, they'll have a few tables, but I imagine you won't see as many. And um, similar to activities, when we get to it, they're gonna look at cohorting. So you'd have groups of people. I think it would be going back to more like traditional dining. Here's your dining times. Um, so that way you don't have crowds of people and you sort of have the same group of people in the dining room at the same time-ish. So again, less just random interactions with people. And similar to what we've had before, but again, disinfecting your hands upon entry and leaving any of the restaurants or dining facilities. So on to activities. So for those of you who may have kids or want to use the nursery, those types of areas, the nursery and child play areas should be outside as much as possible. Additionally, they uh, want to reduce the number of kids indoors, so they're going to have less availability, which, I mean, judging on the Disney Cruise Lines, those nurseries are booked up way before. Like, you, you know, you're booking there at your time where you can book these things and they're completely sold out. So that's going to be interesting for those types of crews. Uh, also, everything needs to be thoroughly cleaned. They're talking about cohorts, so groups of kids at the same time again, as opposed to having people queuing and waiting up. And the goal is just to ensure that social distancing is, is in place and everything's cleaned thoroughly. So, you know, there's going to be a lot more focus on those things and they're going to be probably a lot smaller when it comes to the number of uh, kids allowed. Yeah, so there is childcare, but the availability might be less, but there might be less passengers on the ship. So... And on to sort of theaters. So what's that going to kind of be like? A lot of us like to go to the, you know, the comedy shows or the theaters. Uh, they are going to be in place with social distancing. So you're going to have a 1.5 meter social distance area around you. And again, they also did say the recommendation is masks to be worn indoors, especially when non-ventilated. So that would definitely fall into that category. Mm-hmm. 
the casinos um, will can still be open. Uh, so a lot of these things you're hearing, they'll still be open, but just with a little change. So less machines, less chairs. They'll have markings on the floor. I get think like you've seen in some of the grocery stores. So this is how you work your way around and trying to avoid people from crowding around machines and tables. And again, as it's inside, they are suggesting that you wear a mask. Uh, we're not people who frequent the casino too awesome, often, but um, I know that in many ships, it is a smoking area, the mask, uh, and you have to have your mask on. I think for a lot of people, it's also a social experience. You're going down to be at the tables together or see other people. So I'm not sure if that will affect people's experience um, having that at the casino, but they will still be open. Uh, also, your hairdressers, your salons, your spas, your gyms, they're all gonna be open. So again, masks because it's indoors, close contact. They'll be limiting capacity and they do have to keep record of who has been in and out. So on to pools. Of course, a lot of us also enjoy the pools. Indoor pools will not be opened. However, anything that has walls or ceilings that lift will be allowed. You see these in Alaska cruises and so forth where the top will open up so you can get fresh air in. So those will be allowed, but anything that's fully indoor won't be. So like the uh, probably the pools in the spa areas that don't really have mm -hmm. things that lift off. So those probably won't be opening. Um, they do also recommend that you uh, rinse off with soap. Uh, before and after you go into the pool. So that's a bit of a change mm -hmm. when it comes to, to being able to get into the pools. They're gonna be recommending that people actually do rinse off with soap. And I know they usually say it, but nobody really follows it. Well, it's usually just rinse off, right? And yeah. and sometimes they don't even have drainage because it's just the pool deck's wet. So I guess they'll wanna make sure that the showers are using or it's set up that you are showering in areas with proper drainage for soap or else the deck would be crazy slippery yeah. off yeah. of soap. And uh, they will allow pairs of loungers. So it seems as though you're going to be able to have sort of socially distanced loungers. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be, they don't really recommend the group numbers, but there's basically going to be allowing the loungers to all be socially distanced. And there's also a recommendation in place as to how many people should be allowed on those cruise ships so that you're able to maintain this. So if you're on a 5,000 person cruise ship, for instance, they're not going to really want you to pack that 5,000 mm -hmm. 5, person cruise ship with people. So that'll reduce the number of people, but also the number of staff. Yeah, there's rules around per square meter of water, how many people should be in the pool, how many people should be in the hot tub. So they've got all those rules, just know it will be limited capacity. Yeah, and that's gonna be very interesting just in general on how they do that, because those pools can get pretty crazy. Oh, I remember those hot tubs. I'm like, I don't know how you're getting any more people in yeah. those hot tubs. So now it's only like single person or cabin. So that's not bad either. Yeah. <laughs> So just to talk a little bit more around the cohorts. So one of the things that they want to do is only allow a certain number of people to be able to access activities at a certain time. So a good example of this is mini putt, for instance, where you've got 18 holes, you could have, you know, 18 groups on the mini putt course. And so you could sign up for like a two o'clock cohort and everybody starts on a different hole, for instance, and everybody rotates around through the 18 holes and then everybody clears off 30 minutes later, you clean, et cetera, et cetera. Then you bring in everybody else another 30 minutes later. So that's what they mean by cohorting. Uh, and you'll see this stuff with excursions as well, which is our next point. So when it comes to your ports and your excursions, they will be, you, you will be having them. It will be a similar process. I, you know, we're used to hand sanitizing when we get back on, but it will be hand sanitizing when you get off and when you get back on. They may be doing temperature screening. It didn't say that it was mandatory. So I guess that could be up to the cruise line. And at the terminal, just to make sure that there are proper procedures for social distancing so that there isn't any overcrowding. If there are having to be tender, so I guess that's one time you'd get in those lifeboats yeah. um, or other forms of transportation, they need to make sure that you're able to maintain social distancing. Those are times where you would wanna be wearing a mask. So does that mean some of those lines will be even longer? I don't know, but again, if there's less people uh, and, and even when you're on the excursions, you may be wearing face masks. So there's a lot that the cruise line is expected to do in terms of communication with excursion companies, with local authorities to make sure that everybody's expectations, procedures, safety rules are being followed. And it's a safety for passengers crew, but it's also safety for the locals at the port that you're going to as well. So there's some of the excursions to maybe some of the higher, busier areas at that port, they're not gonna be offering. So. You know, I think that 
depending what you're hoping for with a cruise, you know, some of those ports you're going to, not all of the excursions will be available and safety, hand sanitizing, face masks, it sounds like are gonna be the main, main things. So that's the list of sort of passenger centric uh, components that the European Union has come out as recommendations to open up cruising. Uh, there is also a partnership going on right now between Royal Caribbean and Norwegian Cruise Lines, and they've hired a bunch of former sort of CDC and so forth uh, people to put forth their own recommendations as well, which I will expect will probably be in somewhat line with EU here. Mm -hmm. um, but that's sort of the outline of what you as a passenger can expect when it comes to the ship experience, when it comes to getting on, getting off excursions, etc. And I think that the Cruise Line International Association, which as we said, encompasses many of those North American cruise lines that we see, a lot of this we're going to see, a lot of this we already saw with NCL coming out. I think for me, as we start getting back into normal, I mean, we, we're in Canada and we're in an area of Canada where the pandemic is not is not very bad right now. We're not having too many new cases. And so, yes, we are still, you know, in like stage two of opening, but I think that when it is the the risk levels are lower and people are going to restaurants, more theaters, I think it's gonna be normal to wear a mask. Like I see people in these Disney vlogs and, mm -hmm. and you just wear your mask. I know I go to the grocery store, I've got a couple masks in my bag, I got a couple masks in the car, you throw it on. It's, I think that you are away, there will be some changes, um, but for me, it wouldn't ruin, like none of the things that have come out would ruin my trip. If I got on the trip and they're like, here's a face mask, you have to wear it when you walk down the hall, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> I can take it off in my room. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I can still go and lie by the pool and relax, or I can still do the rock climbing wall. Like to me, none of the things that have come out would ruin it. And I'm, I would be interested to see with less passengers how that plays out in some of those things where there are usually huge lines to get to try the activities if there still will be or theaters where you, you can't get in to see the show. Like, I'm just interested to see how that will play out. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of stuff where because there's less people on the cruise ship, your availability to actually do stuff might be greater mm -hmm. just because as much stuff might not be booked out. You're kind of seeing this with Disney reopening. If anybody saw any of the cast member previews and stuff that have been going on, you can kind of see that a lot of the major rides are like a five minute wait because you know there's nobody in line. <laughs> Yeah, I do also think hearing some of these things, the extra cleaning, like is that gonna take more crew members or would, would some of your extra staff you would have maybe had in the dining rooms where you don't have as many be able to do that? Is that gonna cost more money, the more money for cleaning equipment? And if you're offering, one of the suggestions is offering more shows every evening. Well, if you're offering a show, maybe you used to only do it once or twice and you're now having to do it three or four times, like, is that going to cost them more money? And then what does that mean for the pricing of prices of cruising? Well, and I think this is temporary. These are only these measures are only in place to get you to start restart cruising, ideally with some sort of a vaccine or, you know, who knows what uh, they're going to be able to, uh, you know, get rid of some of these things. I do think in a lot of cases, though, especially with cruise lines, once you put some of the stuff in place, it's hard to roll it back. So, and I mean that from sort of a price and sort of reduction of value. You know, you look at the, a lot of the airlines who are no longer really giving out meals with flights anymore. I can expect that, you know, they're probably gonna continue doing that because it saves them money not providing you with food. Mm -hmm. And now people are kind of used to it, so let's not do it. Uh, you know, so some of these opportunities where there's probably them saving a dollar, uh, they'll probably try to keep in place. And then everywhere where they're spending more money, like on the cleaning and so forth, they'll probably try to not have that in place, right? So there you have it. That is everything that you need to know from a customer uh, sort of cruising perspective when it comes to what it could be when you get on the ship and what your experience might be like. Again, we will have another, uh, another video coming shortly about the other side of this, which is all the stuff the cruise line actually needs to do in order to reopen when it comes to safety measures in place, safety plans, things like that, uh, how they have to handle a patient who does come down with COVID on a cruise ship, et cetera, et cetera. So we will have that video coming shortly. So make sure you like and subscribe and get those notifications. We do hope that you've enjoyed our video, you found it informative. We'd like to hear your opinions. Do you agree with what we thought? Are there any of these new measures that would stop you from cruising to begin with? Is there things that you think that they should have added in? Please do leave that in the comment section below. We really like hearing everybody's opinion and having a bit of a discussion. So thanks again for watching and happy travels.